I'm Casey James, and this is the story of the Bridge House. Possession, I repeated, like an idiot, chills crawling over the entirety of my skin. That also sounds like a bad idea. What do you mean it's too late for that? Too late for regrets, said the phantom voice. You're inside now, with the rest of us. I swallowed. Inside what, I wondered? The house? I didn't say anything. The phantom voice chuckled again, but all it said was, <laughs> Do let me know if you need help lighting your ether stone. Sure, I said, already backing out of the room with no intention of doing any such thing. Its laughter followed me out <laughs> and down the stairs. <laughs> I want to say that I calmly made my way back downstairs to the second floor, but that would be a lie. In all honesty, I'll admit that I fled. I scurried down the stairs with my heart pounding and horror crawling up and down my spine, as if that little distance would do anything to ward off the invisible, but not quite intangible, inhabitant of the tower library. I barely remember passing through the seething ocean swells of the staircase that second time. On the first floor landing, I stopped to catch my breath. Nothing was chasing me. Nothing that I could see, at least. And I really would kick myself if I tripped and fell down the stairs in my hurry and ended up breaking my neck and turning into another one of the ghosts in the bridge house. It seemed to have enough of those already. To the right of the landing, there was a closed door, and to the left, an open hallway with a railing, separating it from the open space above the living room. I didn't feel any need to revisit the living room, let alone the rest of the ground floor, and so the claustrophobic urge to put more distance between myself and whatever that voice was had me turning left and striding along the hall. I quickly passed the mezzanine section with its open space and stepped into a dark and windowless hallway. An open door to my left showed a laundry, complete with a vintage washing machine and a clean steel trough, moonlight pouring in through the window since I hadn't bothered to search out the light switches. A second door led into a powder room, decorated in green and gold and ahead of me a third door had been torn off its hinges and lay in the hallway at an angle. To my right, though, untouched by whatever violence had passed here, there was a quiet space, not quite a room and not quite part of the hallway, set up as a small gallery. On the walls, framed prints of famous surrealist paintings glowered down at me, with melting clocks and supersaturated colours, connected by a twisting mural of snaking lines and airbrushed graffiti-esque tags in some unknown script. A veiled woman, wearing a crown of flowers, stared down from a huge canvas on the opposite wall, her sheer white dress veiling, but not hiding, her nipples, and the thatch of dark hair at her groin, then spreading and fading into the tide, ocean at her feet, and tangling into the sails of a fleet of ships. She had the same dark, lustrous hair and copper skin as Kezia Gilman did in the photographs downstairs. In another canvas, a juggler capered at the foot of a mountain, half his face grinning like a skull, while the other half was caught in a grimace of fear or sorrow, and fishhooks pierced both his eyelids and drew them upwards, towards small fishing boats that floated among the clouds around the top of the mountain. That one was especially disturbing, since the juggler had his hand on his naked, erect cock, and the flushed and turgid head was painted in exquisite, almost grotesque detail. 
I wasn't even sure how I could see the colors and painted forms so well in the dark. Moonlight from the laundry refracted through the space, caught and reflected off of mirrors hung in amongst the paintings. I could see fragments of my own reflection in them, but they must have been curved, like funhouse mirrors, because they showed the walls and lines of the house in warped, unreal perspective. In front of the paintings and the mirrors stood a perfect life-size reproduction of Cellini's Perseus with the head of Medusa, in bronze, just like the original. Here, the conquering hero, holding the severed head of a monster, a woman with snakes for hair, whose gaze would turn everyone she saw to stone, complete with the green and black patina of age that lends expression to the face of Medusa's bodiless head in the sculpture. I stopped to appreciate the statue, and as my eyes slowly adjusted to the dark, I saw that it wasn't alone. An Art Deco Sphinx, also in bronze, stood in one corner, and in the other a sculptural interpretation of Eros and Psyche embracing. Or perhaps it was just a winged angelic being and a human. It was made of pale stone, maybe marble, and it was truly beautiful. Not something I would have expected to see in an abandoned house in the middle of nowhere. Whoa, I breathed, or something like that, just to myself. I'm an art school nerd. Not a critic, not an expert, but even so. Never got to do anything with it, really, although I had grand plans when I signed up. But... I recognised these famous paintings and sculptures, things you'd see in a museum, if you're lucky. Some of them you have to go to Europe for, see them in context. I went to Rome to see the Parthenon and the Colosseum, and the weight of years in those buildings is like nothing else. It's a little like the feeling the bridge house gives me, actually, that feeling of age and significance. Something to do with the acoustics, I think, and the angles of the architecture. In the corner of my eye, one of the paintings moved. Which, in any normal situation, that would be delusional. Paintings don't move. The things in paintings don't move. Weird scratching sounds coming from the walls, and there were soft scratching sounds coming from the walls, would be rats or air in the pipes, maybe, in an old house like this. Here, not so much. The eyes of the bronze head of Medusa blinked, and the head slowly began to turn towards me. As I stared, frozen, somewhere in the shadows, I heard a child laughing <laughs> quietly, that soft musical giggle of a happy two-year-old with a new toy. That, I thought, is it. I'm leaving. I'm going to go downstairs, out the front door, and fuck the rain and the wind and everything else. I could handle the ghosts and the visions, which might, if I was lucky, be just sense impression memories anyway. And creepy feelings, even moving paintings. Even the disembodied phantom voice upstairs. This, though... This was a step and a half too far. I turned to leave, to retrace my path to the stairs and down to the entrance hall. But behind me, the narrow mezzanine walkway no longer crossed the dim shadows of the living room. Instead, a hall lined with funfair mirrors stretched into the distance, filled with a myriad of reflections, all of them distorted and strange. The only light was moonlight, still reflecting into the mirrors from somewhere. I turned back around, only to see the bronze face of Medusa, grotesque and oddly beautiful, framed by writhing, hissing bronze snakes. I averted my gaze, just in case, 
and watched her reflection in the mirror, as her lips twisted in a grin, displaying teeth like pearls, white like something deadly. Like something dead and rotted, like bones and driftwood bleached by the sun and left to dry, like salt. Even paler against the bronze of her skin and hair, and the shadows gathered around her. Okay, this is not good, I muttered. Not good at all. Behind Medusa, the mirrors showed a series of distorted hallways, angles twisting together with mirrors on the walls and stone statues of people standing every so often along the corridors, caught in the midst of motion. I was certain that the reflections were lies, that the gallery and the broken door I'd seen before had still been there, behind the bronze statue. But I wasn't willing to look again to make sure. Not if looking at the face of Medusa directly might literally turn me to stone. I don't know what I was thinking. I really don't. It took me a good thirty seconds of half-panicked staring before my brain made sense of what I was looking at, and I realised that the disturbing and distorted hallways were nothing more supernatural than a secret passageway, lined with curved mirrors and hidden behind a false wall, now revealed by a sliding panel that had also blocked the hallway I'd come in through. I belatedly noticed that the floor under my left foot had depressed slightly. That single floorboard pressed down just a little below the level of the rest. It was a pressure plate. Laughter bubbled up in my throat, relieved and a little hysterical. I really thought for a second that, well, like I said, I don't know what I was thinking. I stared at the floor for a few seconds, then lifted my foot. The board stayed pressed. I tried stepping on it again, but it didn't reset. Maybe the mechanism was stuck, gummed up, or just old. I crouched down to poke at it with my fingers, but it was well and truly stuck, and so was I. With Medusa behind me, or her head at least. I walked over to the sliding panel, hidden as it was, by a curved mirror that didn't even show me my own reflection until I was right in front of it. There was no obvious way to release the catch, or slide it back the other way. Even tracing my fingers along the edges of the panel, I didn't find anything. Still unnerved by the moving statue behind me, I took a slow, hesitant step into the mirrored corridor, then another. Nothing terrible happened, although I was disoriented by being surrounded by mirrors that didn't show me my reflection reliably. I would see nothing but mirrors reflecting one another for a few steps, and then suddenly I was surrounded by distorted images of myself. Or worse, distorted images of one of the statues that lined the corridor. There were several of them, though fewer than I had thought at first all reflected into multiplicities, with their reflections distorted into twisted shadows and overly long fingers reaching out into the empty space behind the mirrors. The statues themselves were perfectly, unreasonably realistic, like a wax cast of a person more than a marble carving. For all, they were made of stone. I tapped the first one with a fingertip, just to be sure. It was of a tall man with a mocking smirk and saturnine eyebrows, dressed in an old-fashioned three-piece suit. The second statue was of a child, shaggy curls escaping from under a cap, a small ball in their hand, (laughs) and an expression of gleeful mischief on their face. The third statue was of Kezia, except it wasn't. It was so very close. The cheekbones and eyes were the same, 
but her hair had been replaced by a writhing nest of stone serpents, characterizing her as Medusa. She held one hand up in front of her face, fingers spread as if to ward off the sight of whatever was in front of her. Real metal rings, set with glittering precious stones, adorned her stone fingers, seven of them. Amethyst and rose quartz, garnet, a blue stone that I would have called a sapphire just because I didn't know any other blue gemstones, and another that looked like green tiger's eye, striped dark and pale green. And two clear stones, one so bright it might be a diamond, and the other misted like cloudy ice. The same seven stones I'd just seen in the tower library. I frowned and edged past the statue, watching its reflection in the mirrors. Just after that, the mirrored hallway ended abruptly, spitting me out into a small room, lit only by the moonlight seeping in through a skylight and reflecting off the mirrors which continued in from the hallway. They didn't line the walls entirely here, though. Instead, six huge mirrors hung, one on each of the six walls of the odd little hexagonal room, with the doorway I was standing in, entering in the corner between two of the sides of the hexagon. Something about the dimensions of the room made me uneasy all over again. Looking into it left me feeling slightly dizzy, with a slight tingling headache, as if my eyes were trying to focus on something that I couldn't quite see, or I was staring into a bright light, even though there wasn't any such light there. The wood-panelled walls in between the six mirrors were painted with glyphs, which extended down onto the timber floor. Runic patterns forming spirals and secondary patterns in how they were laid out beside and over the top of one another. I found it hard to focus on some of them. They seemed to shift and twist under my gaze, and each time I looked at them, I found my eyes skittering away again before I could take in the symbols or the pattern of them. I took one step into the room without quite intending to, carried along by my existing momentum from walking along the mirrored corridor, and then stopped. My skin and bones vibrated as if I had stepped on a live wire or into some sort of electrical current, a sickly sort of buzzing sensation. It felt like I had honeybees in my fingernails and under my scalp. In the middle of the floor was a glass jam jar, empty except for a single black button and an ornate antique-looking silver key. And on the walls, in each of the six enormous mirrors, I could somehow see the reflection of that statue of Kezia as Medusa instead of my own reflection. What the fuck, I said quietly. Kezia's reflection seemed to smirk at me, the dim, cool light and ever-present shadows turning the writhing stone snakes on her head to something close to the dark, black-brown of her hair in that old photograph, and in the memory of her that I saw next to the piano downstairs. There were no other doors or doorways visible, but as I turned to retrace my steps, Kezia's reflection breathed softly, Deutsch, Deutsch. I froze, blinking. The reflection of the statue had spoken to me. Its lips had moved. I saw them. I don't even know if I made a sound or not. Deutsch, breathed Kezia again. I just stared into the mirror, while six versions of Kezia swayed and frowned or smiled or smoked. Each one had a different expression on her face. Why not? I asked finally. The Watcher in the Deep will see you, 
whispered Kezia. In my peripheral vision, something huge and black shifted in the mirror, a suggestion of some vast shape, incomprehensible to the conscious mind. Okay, so I was trapped in here, in a mirror maze made up of a single 30-foot corridor and a small room, on pain of something horrific noticing me, which, admittedly, sounded quite bad. I frowned. Don't look at the mirrors or at you, I asked Kezia. Her reflection smirked at me again and said nothing. Fine, I said. Fine. If that was how this was going to go. It was, after all, only a thirty-foot corridor and a single room. On an impulse, I stepped forward and grabbed the jam jar off the floor, along with its contents. You never know when a random key will come in useful. Then I shut my eyes tightly and turned around. This is not my first ghost story. This is not my first haunting. Two steps took me to the doorway, my outstretched hand touching the cool glass of the mirrors and the stone of the doorway itself. I walked slowly back up the corridor, eyes shut, my hand trailing along the mirrored wall to my left. I shuddered as my fingers moved across the first statue, tracing the side of Kezia's shoulder, the curves of her breasts, and the sensuous roughness of the snakes draped across her torso. But I didn't dare step away in case I lost the wall and ended up having to open my eyes to get my bearings. The child was easier, just a brush of my fingers over the top of their cap though I thought for a second I felt a small hand reach up to pat mine. I can't have, though. Just like I can't possibly have felt Kezia's arm move under my fingers, or her hand brush across the curve of my ass as I walked past her. There were no ghostly touches when I got to the last statue, but I might have imagined an echo of a chuckle, just like the ones I'd heard upstairs.